Well, good afternoon. My name is John McGuire. On behalf of the Milton Historical Society, I invite you to the third annual uh, edition of our lecture series. That sound you heard a while ago, some of you were here early. Well, you're here for training, right? So, <laughs> I can get you indoctrinated to that. I, I wish, but we, we have that straightened out. I thank you for taking the time from your Sunday afternoons to support these uh, lectures. And it will help a great day out there in the Pennsylvania winter months will look more tolerable. We have several people to thank for making these lectures possible, beginning with the Dalton High School administration and custodial and IT staff setting up, and we sure we have here. Brett Posterman doing a terrific job against the bookmarks that look like this. You may have seen them out of town. I can't think of one up somewhere. And some posters as well that are scattered here and there. Um, and we'll tell with the advertising. And also, the uh, Standard Journal and the Daily Item. You may have seen the ads there, I, I hope. Uh, they have been very patient with me. Honestly, back and forth. I don't have any guys. Sure, it looked just right. Also, we do thank them. And of course, our speakers in this series who uh, uh, committed their time and talent to helping us out this way. And a special thanks again to Chuck Everett for generously sponsoring these uh, lectures. So we're most appreciative of that. If you enjoy these lectures, and we like to think that you do, and you would like to be more involved with the historical society, we encourage you to consider a membership. And there's information in the hallway, and several very specially trained executive board members scattered around there who can help you out on that end. And you can help us um, keep history alive in rep and in our mission to preserve and promote history, we think we have put together another quality program for you this year. We hope you think so too. Some of you uh, who attended these lectures the last year might remember pointing out a very simple survey to your feedback on what you wanted to hear. We were interested in topics you wanted to learn more about. Some of you said you like state and national level lectures. Many of you expressed a preference for local subjects. We listened. While we know it's not possible to please all the people all the time, we are striving to please as many people as we possibly can, as often as we can. For local history people, and you know who you are, uh, today's speaker and topic is for you as is our March lecture when Scott Bomboy from the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia will be here and be looking at covered bridges with us. And next month, we have a special guest, I put that in quotation mark, Betsy Ross with us as portrayed by Jill Lawrence, who is a terrific and talented actress. In the third year of our program, she is our first interpreter who will offer an interactive discussion with her visitors, that would be you. Um, and having known Jill personally for many years, I can assure you she is a dynamic performer and you won't want to miss. As always, our goal with these lectures is to inform, enlighten, and even entertain. Who isn't fascinated with trains, I wonder, at some level? <laughs> Chances are when we think about trains, we recall legendary passenger trains like the Orient Express in Europe or the Super Chief that connected Los Angeles to Chicago or even the Metro Liner that runs from, currently runs from New York City to Washington, D.C. All of them are iconic and have been featured in books and films. They are, they are historic and well-known trains for sure. But I confess, my favorite immediate recollection of a train is the one I grew up with. 
the American flyer on the platform. <laughs> that, right, that, right, that ran the figure eight route around the bottom of our Christmas tree. I still have that train, although it's no longer in service. Whatever images come to mind when I think of trains, they have been a vital component of our infrastructure and the lifeblood of population centers, large and small. Passenger trains, a rare sight anymore, move people. Freight trains, the subject of this afternoon's presentation, move goods in and out of communities that people rely on in their daily lives. In State College, where I spend most of my time, there are no trains that travel through the town. And so it is a treat for us when we are here in Milton, not only to see a train, but to hear it. We still love the sound of that whistle, which I think of as locomotive poetry. <laughs> Regrettably, though, it is more and more a sound of a time gone by. Our speaker today has had a fascination with the trains that began at an early age, that became a passion that developed into an application. Tim Bittner is a lifelong resident of Union County and a Milton High School alum. His interest in history was evident here as a student because he says he was the only subject in which he earned straight A's, which means <laughs> <laughs> he was a much better student than I was. After high school, Tim earned a degree in agriculture education at Penn State University. For the past four decades, he has been self-employed in, in a green industry, what you call it, a green industry, and now the owner of Buffalo Creek Landscapes. Very much a community-minded person, Tim sits on the board of directors of the Milton Savings Bank. He is a member of the Central Pennsylvania chapter of the National Railroad Historical Society and holds membership in the Friends of the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania, the Friends of the East Broad Top Railroad, and the Union County Historical Society. And for the past two years, he has been president of the Milton Historical Society. This afternoon, we are going to learn about how national gauge, I'm sorry, how narrow gauge railroads transform life in the White Deer Valley for the late 20th century. So, if you will, please welcome Tim Bittner. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Appreciate you folks coming out. Really a great turnout, more than we expected. That's why we were having trouble shuffling chairs. So, again, thank you for supporting the lecture series by the Milton Historic Society. Excuse me. As I look around the room, I see a, a number of familiar faces, especially with the uh, hobby of rail fan. So there's a lot of trained people I know here this afternoon. We're going to look at three railroads, all narrow gauge. Uh, the Lewisburg Buffalo Valley out of Lewisburg, the White Deer Valley Railroad out of White Deer, the village of White Deer, and then later in that life, we, we came on with the White Deer and Loganton Railway, which combined freight and passenger service up to Sugar Valley from White Deer uh, to Loganton. So those are the three individual railroads. They're all going to be narrow gauge. We'll start it off with, uh, this is of course a model of a Climax Class B uh, engine in my garden railroad back in the 1990s in my home from Lewisburg. We've now seen a move from there. And I don't have an operating layout today, but uh, you have engine number one, like I say, it's a, it's a G scale locomotive, the same size as you see over to my right as locomotive number two. Again, a Climax engine. You're going to see a lot of pictures of Climax engines. So that, you know, this is again in the 90s. I had it for about five years. That's my deck in the background. But that's the, the brass track it runs on right here. It runs off of the power, off the electrical power, off the track. I narrowed down the title for the presentation, uh, Narrow Gauge Crossing. And it's, it's where, where you have two different narrow gauge railroads crossing each other. And only one other place that that occur in Pennsylvania, not in my coming county. Let me set the stage in the history timeline. Uh, we're talking about Henry Ford producing automobiles. We're talking about the sinking of the Titanic. And we're talking about World War I. Two goals in mind. I'd like you to leave here with a little bit better knowledge of, of narrow gauge railroading, a little more knowledge than maybe you came in with, and 
and a, 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 a special way of life that existed here thir within 30 minutes drive from west of us, a, a lifestyle that existed 100 years ago. I want to thank my niece, um, Brianna Bittner. Without her, the PowerPoint presentation would not be possible. <laughs> we would be flashing 35 millimeter slides. I thank Brianna. And uh, keep in mind the black and white photographs, they're all 100 years of age. I had some modification done to some of them, but they're all 100 year images. Here we have the wall map. The original map is three by six. It's on my, my study wall. Um, this is the 1904 survey map, which to my right on the white table, you can take a look at a smaller scale. It's actually easier to read than this one. But you have the Calk the, uh, Railroad, the Lewisburg Buffalo Valley coming out of Lewisburg. We'll talk about that shortly. Uh, and then you have the White Deer Valley that kind of followed the White Deer Pike that we have today, or I-80. I-80 would be right in here. This is the south-facing uh, White Deer Mountain. And this would be Nittany Mountain, north-facing. And of course, the crossing that I titled the program took place right in here. Here you had a logging railroad crossing the other railroad. So pretty unique, pretty unique uh, you know, spot in history, I, I, I truly believe. Of course, after 1904, after the legal settlement, now, now there was no you know, crossing on two different railroads. This, again, this was surveyed to, to do the court settlement in 1904. Uh, I really, really would, you know, have to share with you, and some of you I'm sure most, some have any interest would have these two books. Here's the first one, a uh, paper booklet. These came out in the early 1970s. Benjamin Klein authored both of these. But uh, between Benjamin Klein and Thomas Tabor of Muncie, those two gentlemen, they took a decade of their life knocking on doors, interviewing firsthand or secondhand uh, individuals recording this history that you're going to hear today. Uh, my hat goes off to these men. Uh, Mr. Thomas, is, uh, Thomas Tabor is still alive but not doing well. Mr. Klein passed away in the 90s. But I had the opportunity to interview both these individuals in the past to help put this program together. Uh, again, this is just two of 13 that covers the whole state of Pennsylvania. Most of you in this room would recognize this as the formal site of the Pennsylvania House uh, Complex in Lewisburg. Now we call it Pennsylvania Commons, Pennsylvania House Commons, or just the giant store. <laughs> <laughs> but it is in this area that the, uh, the, the uh, Lewis, Lewisburg Buffalo Valley, Mr. Monroe Call, got its start somewhere in that vicinity. I can't pin it down to a, a, a particular area, but in that general area of the, of the Commons, where the uh, railroad began, the eastern terminus, along with their sawmills. Here's a Sanborn uh, map, insurance map of 1902. Here's the actual mill. Here's the logging uh, unloading platforms that would be elevated over what we call standard gauge, which we'll talk about. Here's the, uh, the engine house for the operation. It was quite an extensive uh, operation. Unfortunately, a very high risky business when it comes to fire. The mill that you see here burned down twice. Once in 1900, five years later in 1905. The operation closed down in 1906. It operated for nine years, 19, uh, I'm sorry, 1897 to 1906. The owner again was Monroe Call. Here's a picture of the sawmill of a gang there in Lewisburg. Um, uh, this had the ability to produce 40,000 feet of lumber per day. 40,000 feet of lumber per day. Uh, at its prime, it loaded up to uh, 500 car loads of lumber. Over 500 car loads per month in its prime. And um, in a higher, um, again, it burned twice you know, the last time in 1905. Here's a, a view shot of the narrow gauge up on top of the loading platform. They, they would drop the wood or haul it down into standard gauge and uh, the parts of the load there. Two different sets of more loading blocks. The railroad would take three logging trains per day from Lewisburg, 10 miles northwest of Lewisburg, to the area of Spruce Run Water Dam. 
uh, area. Mr. Coffee, being a smart businessman, he had not one but two interchanges with two standard gauge railroads. Uh, one, the Pennsylvania Railroad, and two, the, the Philadelphia Reading or the Reading Railroad. Uh, so again, he, he, he wasn't locked into race by one railroad. Here we have a picture. This was taken in Cory, Pennsylvania, the home of uh, Climax Manufacturing in Cory, PA, in the northwest part of the state. This is uh, engine number two. Uh, built in 19, or excuse me, 1897, the same year that the operation started in Lewisburg. Here we have engine number seven of the Lewisburg and Buffalo Valley Railroad. Again, another Climax Class B engine, built in 1899, weighing in at 30 tons. Top speed, 15 miles per hour. Uh, the, the railroad, Colts Railroad, had a total of eight steam locomotives. Six of them were Climax uh, engines, uh, all fueled by coal. Here we have the original engine, but uh, it was just used strictly for a photo prop. Here's some of Kopp's uh, 500 men that worked on his payroll. And again, just again, look, look at the face, look at the clothes, look at the individuals. Uh, pretty, it's, this tells a story in my opinion. The Climax engine was a geared steam engine, great for tight curves and changes in elevation. Here you have two uh, passenger tickets, the Lewisburg Buffalo Valley Railroad tried passenger service for the first 10 miles out of Lewisburg. Not very successful, never proved to be a money maker. But uh, it tried it for uh, about seven or eight years, first 10 miles. You're going to see this special, what I call a special excursion train, uh, one coach filled with business people, uh, businessmen, the reason all unknown, uh, could not find a reason for the excursion trip, but there's three or four slides that you're going to see of the same train. Crossing Lewis, uh, near Lewisburg, the uh, Buffalo Creek area, today we have, have it called the Strawbridge Road. This slide is entitled 30 Tons of Trouble. 30 <laughs> Tons of Trouble. <laughs> this is Locomotive 7 that you've seen er earlier. Of course, derailed off the bridge. Uh, some people think it was uh, an issue of speed, but it was up and running uh, shortly thereafter. But it became uh, known as, uh, as Monroe's Jinx Locomotive. It was involved in a number of other wrecks. <laughs> Here again, another slide of the excursion train. This is now at, at uh, Kalk Station, out past the Spruce One Water Dam. You know that area west of West Milton. Uh, again, approximately 10, 12 miles northwest of Lewisburg. Uh, you can again see it's, it's a group of men all dressed up. Reasons all known. Kalk Station, another name was, it was Wool, Wool Heaters Camp. Wool Heater Camp, and it served as a base camp for all the logging operations. Another slide of the camp, I'm assuming that's the bunkhouse behind the group of business people. You have a, a narrow gauge track here. I'm sure there's stables for the horses and mules and, and some shops and, and things like that. Uh, again, located here near uh, Spruce Run Water Dam, which is a public water supply for Lewisburg and Melton. A view looking west of the camp, again, uh, this camp served the needs of over 500 government. So you can imagine the, the needs of supplies, support staff. I think of cook, serving, laundry, care of livestock. Uh, the list could go on and on. But Mr. Kopp had nine various logging camps uh, west of here into the mountains. It was, it was a sizable uh, operation. One of the unique features of the railroad, as we will talk about the White Deer Valley, is the narrow gauge, and this is a great example of 36 inch spacing. That's what makes it a narrow gauge with rock for ballast. Very, very rare. According to Mr. Klein, only two railroads, and we're going to talk about both of them. This one, in the White Deer Valley, did, did uh, use the ballast, which would add support and drainage to the track. Another example, a close-up of the road bed. Uh, ties were spaced about 24 inch centers, basically with logs, uh, six, seven, eight foot logs. 
Uh, no dander brush, not, not real large material. I'm guessing this area was timbered out. But Mr. Kopp uh, had a total of 90 miles of narrow gauge railroading uh, in western, northwest part of Union County. Winter seen here, you can see how the, the landing <coughs> of the logs easy for loading would be an elevation and a method of cutting and filling to load additional track. So that was the cut and fill method. Again, all elevated for the logging train to be loaded. A nice slide of a, a landing, a log landing, a loading area. Uh, mules would bring the logs in. They would get stacked. This pile over here, this is uh, considered as railroad ties. Not the ties that we have today, but more of a rounding natural finish, uh, not pre-assoted, of course. But that, those are the railroad ties to the left of the track. Train coming into the land. The best method to get the logs from the cutting area to the loading area was the team of mules. Mules definitely worked better, stronger, uh, more laid back than, say, horses, but they also used horses. Monroe Cop uh, had over 200 head of horses and mules used in the operation. So quite, quite a sizable operation, much larger than the one in White Deer that we're going to talk about soon. Uh, just note the size of the, of the logs. They're not huge logs. They were used for mine crops. You know, as you go in underground in the mine and coal mining east of us, uh, you needed some type of uh, structure to shore up, and that's what these uh, logs would eventually be cut into mine crops. Due to the weight of the, the load, two, two log cars per engine was pretty standard operation. All handwork, all handwork and gravity. A winter scene again, uh, track there in the background. It was listed as a caboose on the roster, so you might be looking at a rear photo of a narrow gauge caboose. Again, note the size of the, of the log. Here's your typical camp. Camp of this size, location, it was on the cost operation, but the only uh, location is unknown. But it could take here up, up to 100 men, feed and, and sleep 100 men, and 50 to 60 teams of mules and horses. So again, quite the operation. Basic tools, of course, your cross cut saw that you would need, the lumber jacks, double bladed axes, there's a uh, oil, cutting oil, and there's some wedges there. Again, look at the men. Look at their expressions. Uh, it tells a story. It was a rough uh, occupation. High risk, hard work, high low pay. To support the lumberjacks, you need a sharpening crew. Here's a three-man sharpening crew. Took, took one to turn the stone, one holding the water pan, and then one sharpening the double-aged axe. The guy there with the axe, he's having way too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last shot of the special excursion, the business train, whatever you want to call it. And uh, this happens to be Mr. Monroe Kopp of Shemokin right there, the owner of the operation. Classic picture. And then the last picture covering uh, Mr. Kopp and the Lewisburg Buffalo Valley Railroad is Mr. Kopp again sitting in here on the right. After closing the operation down in Lewisburg in 1906, they moved down to uh, Old Town, Maryland, and started doing the uh, art scene again, but shut down here in 1906. Unfortunately, Mr. Kopp died in 1911 at the age of 53. Buried in Shemokin today. Moving on to the White Deer Valley uh, Railroad. This is book number two of the series of 13 by Mr. Klein and Mr. Taylor. Again, published in the 1970s. Now we'll focus again on the White Deer Valley Railroad. This is their sawmill, uh, located maybe a half a mile, six tenths of a mile north of, of, of the village of White Deer. This sawmill, Mr. Let me back up. Mr. John Duncan of Lewisburg established the White Deer Valley Railroad in 1900. Unfortunately, Mr. Duncan died unexpectedly in 1904, at which time William Whitmer and Sons of Sunbury purchased the operation in 1904. Later, the Steele brothers got involved, Harry and Charles, and later changed to Whitmer and Steele. 
But like Lewisburg, Buffalo Valley, uh, their mine, main business is mine crops. Again, cutting mine crops to the coal industry east of us. I love this slide here. This is looking east. This would be Watson Town, the west branch of the river, and of course the sawmill with the empty log cars there. This would be a stack of lumber waiting for the Reading Railroad to come in with their standard gauge cars to load out. It's ready for shipping. This is what the site looks like today. This is by the State Forest Department. A small part of the the mill would be right off the screen to my right. But, uh, it's used now at, for, uh, for sports and recreation as a State Forest parking lot. Uh, this is actually, uh, would be the yard, the actual yard, yeah. right in here. This is that elevated spot that you saw maybe on the last slide. It operated under the name of White Deer Valley Lumber Company until 1922, but then later was used in past uh, years after that by private individuals. Here you have a log train came in, coming into the mill operation. The mill's pond is behind the train. They're getting ready to dump the logs into the pond. The smoke that you see are burning bark. Burning bark is what the slide said. But all I wanted to show is the various lengths of logs. Some fairly long uh, logs, but then look at a couple loads of shorter ones right in here. So they came in various lengths uh, in the operation. Here's the first uh, original climax. This is the Class A climax with a vertical boiler. Uh, this is John Duncan's first locomotive. It weighed in at 12 tons versus like a 30 ton climax. Uh, and it was purchased in, in uh, 1889. Second locomotive by, purchased by John Duncan before his death is uh, engine number 309, a climax, class 2, uh, built in 1902. Another shot of engine number 309. Uh, look, look at the weight. 30 tons pressing down on the light rail. Uh, pretty, pretty amazing when you have 30 tons of fair down on the two trucks. I don't know if we have any prawns in the uh, crowd today, but this is Thomas Prawn, uh, the headlight, and, I, and then two more prawns, Charles and Rudy Prawn. So, uh, I'm assuming the white gear area. Some prawns there, three of them represented in that one shot. I, I love this slide, a real excellent portrait of uh, John Duncan and, and company, and the work for Mr. Duncan. Again, just, just the men tell the story. The pot locomotive, again, top speed was about 7 miles an hour compared to 15 or 12 or 15 with the class B. The, the pot ended up at work, working for the Watsontown Brickyard uh, after uh, up to 1914. So it ended up at the Watsontown Brickyard. It was then scrapped in the 20s. Here's some uh, employees of the White Deer Valley uh, Railroad. This is a, a real popular engineer, uh, um, Paul Bingaman. Paul Bingaman, he has the distinct honor of being one of the first uh, owners of a Model T Ford in White Deer Township. <laughs> Here we have the engineer. Buy one of the first vehicles in White Deer Township. <laughs> Empty log train heading west to, the, to new cuttings. You see the, the underbrush. You know, this is what happens when you remove the large trees with the sunlight and the underbrush comes in. Climax, not only did they uh, manufacture steam locomotives, they also constructed log cars. Each car then would have a handbrake that you see through the field. They manufactured log cars in 40 feet. Here we have the, the track gang are all, uh, working on the track. These are not lumber people, lumber guys, but you know, they, they have spike hammers in their hand, a, a shovel up here, working on the track. Um, again, a good picture of 36 inches between the rails. The White Deer Valley Railroad had 16 miles of track, what we call mainline track, between the village of, of White Deer, basically, and, and west to uh, Tea Springs, or Duncan Station. 16 miles to maintain. Here's a uh, construction crew installing new track. Besides those 16 miles of mainline track, 
they had 33 miles of branches or spurs out into the cutting areas. So 33 miles of additional trackage off the main line. A typical shot, picture of a, I think, a, 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 a lumber yard or logging camp uh, in the White Bear Valley. Uh, again, uh, I think it tells a story. The mules, of course, were the real work horses, not the iron horse, uh, but the mules. Uh, and I think maybe it was a lucky day, maybe the gentleman here issued the paper. I'm not sure, but uh, it looks like a man here writing checks on the board. Here's another thing that got me in interest in this uh, subject is the White Bear, this is the White Bear Pipe, State Road, and of course the remains of the, of the main line of the logging railroad. And as, as a high schooler, I, I would see these and, and that would create my interest and I started walking a lot of, a lot of stone ballast track in my high school and, and after. And various places along the pipe you can still see the remains today. My knowledge had crossed the White Deer Pipe three different lo locations. This is probably the best defined area. So it would cross the pipe road was a, a public you know, road back in the early 1900s. And, uh, and so uh, what you have then is, is larger stone on the bottom, smaller stone on top. Now you have vegetation growing in some areas. But you occasionally will find a, a railroad tie, you know, partially decayed, of course. But, find occasional time embedded in the ground. Now we talk, focus our attention on the White Deer Loganton Railway. Uh, this is again, it was chartered uh, in 1906 to extend eight miles from Tea Springs west to uh, Loganton. Not only to provide more additional logging, but also uh, freight and passenger service for Sugar Valley. Um, Again, in 1906, it was a charter. These are just two, two railroad passes, as you see. Here's a view about 1920. The photographer is up on the hill overlooking the village of White Deer. This is, of course, what we have today as, as Route 15. And this is the Philadelphia Reading Station, you know, the Reading Station that's there today. It did the White Deer Logan and had to extend its narrow gauge uh, about six tenths of a mile from White Deer Junction, where the sawmill was, down to the station to interchange with the ready. This is the east side of the station, or the standard gauge. This is now standard gauge track. We compare the two, four feet, eight and a half inches between rails. This station was constructed in 1910 after the original one was burned. Here's a, a timetable from the Reading Railroad. These, these uh, stations up here are listed in New York City, going north to Philadelphia, Kamako, Reading, Shimokin, Lewisburg, uh, and Wayansport. My point is that for the first time, residents of Sugar Valley, Loganton, Kroll, could catch the White Deer Loganton uh, Railway down to the Reading station and interchange with the Reading passenger train and take them anywhere they would like to go, especially major cities on the East Coast. It would be for us like I-80 opened up in 1967, I believe, for us, East and West, or the new bypass that we're waiting to uh, have open. To me, it would be a real game changer in that culture of the early 1900s. So again, for the first time, they could leave their, their homes in Sugar Valley and, and catch a train, you know, three hours later. So pretty, pretty I think, uh, unique feature in, in transportation in the early 1900s. On the west side of the station then is the narrow gauge track. So the narrow gauge track, the train would come down from White Deer Junction or the sawmill area and, and exchange freight and passenger service with the Reading Railroad at the White Deer Station. I do believe that was the outdoor plumbing facility. <laughs> very important, very important. Here's engine uh, number one for the White Deer Loganton Railway. Uh, purchased in 1906, the most remembered employee of the railroad was the conductor, Mr. John Bubb. Mr. John Bubb, the conductor. The Climax engine was believed to be the first one equipped with air brakes and steam heat for passenger service. <coughs> Featured right here again in our backyard. Here you have a 1908 timetable. 
with White Gear in Logan On the left side is the Westward uh, trip, leaving the White Gear station at, at say 920, and then uh, arriving at Logan at, you know, 1150 or 12 o'clock basically. Three scheduled stops, White Gear Junction, again with the sawmill located. Uh, mile run was a scheduled water stop, and then uh, station at Crow, and then on to Logan. The return trip is again on the east, on the uh, eastward would be on the right hand side. And they were in the business of selling excursion trains too, special trips from White Deer up to Tea Springs or Duncan Station, uh, Church Social, Ox Roads, Again, the first passenger train left the station in 1907. Typically, a, a train would consist of one passenger coach and one box car or whatever other car you needed to freight that day. Here's an example. Okay? These special excursion trains to <coughs> Tea Springs, all hands on deck, all cars on deck. Here's a flat car with portable benches. Probably a church social. Pretty amazing. Again, mostly women in this case. Again, look at the outfits. How would you like that? I hope it's you know, summertime. <laughs> How would you like to ride 16 miles with a, a portable vent? <laughs> so here we have a typical train ready to leave the, the Reading Station at White Gear. Coach up front uh, and a, a box car in the back. Uh, heading again uh, westward uh, about two and a half hours. <clears throat> getting to Logan, arriving at Logan. Typical average speed, 10 to 12 miles an hour. Not, one, not only would it call, call passengers, it would haul a freight and even the U.S. mail for Pearl and Logan. Not to mention supplies and, and uh, uh, material foods for the camps. Here we have the original engine of the Climax Class A, the pot, the came the pot, with a, a coach, pulling a coach from the White Deer Station uh, constructed by local carpenters. So they had a couple uh, home home built coaches. The White Deer Valley Railroad charged the White Deer Logan $100 a month for trackage rights over the first 16 miles of their railroad. So it's nothing more than a rent payment for the use of their track. $100 a month, first 16 miles. Scheduled water stop at Mile Run. There's an exit off of I-80 today for Mile Run. This was a scheduled water stop. You have the train crew towards the back and the famous Mr. Love standing there below the cab. Again, and this was a, a lease uh, purchase of the used coach from another narrow gate railroad. Mile Run, 1906. Here, here you have two of the five Climax engines owned by the White Deer and, and uh, Valley Railroad, two of the five Climax engines, taken in 1908, uh, I'm sorry, served, served, uh, served the railroad from 1908 to 1912. And uh, hopefully it was a hunting trip meet, or maybe it was a holdup, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> We're not sure what it was, no, it was a hunting excursion. That is, that they were all loading the supplies out of the box uh, for the hunting trip. Another example of, of a service that the railroad provided to the locals. It's recreation, like a hunting trip, church social at Teesburg. Here's basically the, the picture for the title for the program, uh, Narrow Gauge Crossing. For you railroad buffs, you know, you know what a dime it is, but underneath engine number two, is the remains of a, of a diamond, a 93 intersection between two separate railroads. Here it's a cut rail. So that tells me that, you know, it's no longer, it's after 1904, after the settlement. And, uh, and uh, but again, it still is in existence. I don't have a date for the photograph. But, uh, so that's a narrow gauge crossing. Again, only occurred one other place uh, for logging railroads in the state of Pennsylvania, and that was in Lycoming County. Here we are now moving west onto Tea Springs. And this is a, a location again for church socials, uh, located six, 16 miles west of White Deer, or eight miles east of Loganton in Sugar Valley. Owned by the railroad, it consisted of a large, very large pavilion. I have a picture of just the pavilion. Very large structure. Um, 
also included a bandstand and a refreshment stand. Again, you can see how cool the, the train is. We have the open cars back here, open gondolas filled with people. I'm assuming getting ready to leave Teach Spring. But again, it was a, a destination along the railroad. It gave people a purpose or a reason or value to, to ride the train and then to be entertained at, at the recreation. It could be a church social, like I said, an ox roast. Uh, so uh, to me, it's not a bad business plan if you're the owner of the railroad. Moving a little bit west of Tea Springs is the village of Kroll, four miles east of uh, Loganton, on the east end of Sugar Valley. Uh, this is the station here. You can see it's not very large, but it has a distinct honor of being in Pennsylvania, the only station not located on either end of a narrow gauge railroad. So again, the only railroad that had a station built structure to stop there that's not located on either end of the line. So pretty, pretty remarkable for old station. And then, uh, again, another picture of the, of the Kroll station. The uh, station, they, they did have a station agent who met the train twice a day, up and back, um, and would get the, you know, get the mail and the freight from the village of Crow and Eastville. And I believe there's some ladies in this room today that's related to this young girl right here. So we, we are pretty special. We think it might be around 1904, the, the photograph, but I don't have a confirmed date on that. The station agent did not sell any tickets, did not have the ability to sell tickets, just collect freight and post. Here's a very large mixed train where you have freight cars and a coach, a passenger coach. The slide said nine individual cars. This is at Eastville, just, just west of the village of Crow, but in Eastville. To me, that indicates the importance of the railroad. Even though the railroad only lasted 10 years, what an economic impact would this freight have on Sugar Valley as well as White Deer, but mostly catering to Sugar Valley and residents up there in Logan. I like this slide here. This is the open farmland of Sugar Valley, which exists today. A lot of uh, Mennonites and Amish up there uh, performing agriculture in Sugar Valley. But again, the farmer would bring in uh, fertilizer and coal, but it would export uh, farm produce like apples and other products, as well as uh, lumber, finished lumber, cut lumber. This is a view looking west. This is a, the White Deer Loganton's complex in Loganton. This is the end of the line. This is the western terminus. This would be the station at Loganton, and that's the engine house for the locomotive. Today, it's a vacant site. There's no development except for one house, one two story house sitting back in there. So, still undeveloped. Here's a close up of the train coming west to the station. Sizable station. Uh, this is route, state route 477. This is a Sunday afternoon in July 5th, 1908. You can see the residents of Loganton waiting for the train. Being a Sunday, I'm assuming they're heading for Teesburg. Again, we have a flat car, portable bench. Anything, any piece of rolling stock would be available would go, go to these uh, socials that held at Teesburg. Even the band. <laughs> Even the band. So not the greatest picture, but you can see the instruments there with the band. And again, they had a bandstand just with the band at Teesburg. Quite the social gathering. Here's the train and crew, the open car. Again, locally constructed, open air car. Uh, at the at, uh, station in Loganton, they would have basically a two hour layover, a two hour layover uh, before turning around and heading back to White Deer. West of the station, the end of the line, I like this picture, it's not the greatest uh, photo, but it, uh, it tells the story again. The, the engine, for you folks, you know, how do we turn the engine once we get to the western terminus? How do we turn the engine in the right direction? You go to the left leg of the Y, they would call it. Then there would be a connecting track across the back, and then the engine would be facing the right direction coming east. 
this slide. So that's in place of a turntable, a round mechanism type thing. They had a Y on the turntable to turn the thing again in the right direction. Again, the engine setting at the station here, near what is now 477. The conductor, Mr. John Bow, acting as a, a postal worker, would put the mail sacks in a wheelbarrow, wheel them uphill to the post office in Loganton, a little over a half a mile. So bring them, I'm sure bring the mail back. But that was his job in that two hour layover. There's the degree that he would have the wheel the wheelbarrow. Uh, so here's the train, mixed train at Loganton. Here's the, the 477 into Loganton. Here's the gap in the mountain. The village of Loganton right in there. The 19 uh, census, 1910, I'm sorry, 1910 census has the population of Loganton at 373, 373 bodies. The whole village, the whole area of Sugar Valley was just over 3,000 in 1910. It was actually on the decline from 1900, <coughs> the population of Sugar Valley. Again, here's the same 1908 timetable. Now we're getting ready to head west, I'm sorry, head east, back to White Deer. Um, we're, we're now, this is the e eastward side, Loganton, and then on down to the mile run for water, and then White Deer Junction, and then ending in at the station. So we're going to leave at 2 and get back at 420 in the afternoon. About 10 minutes faster going east due to the lower grade down here. <coughs> And this is the train, I can't say it was the last train to leave Loganton, but the last train departed Loganton on May 31st, uh, 1916. May 31st, 1916. So it, it existed, the train service to Loganton existed for about 10 years. And uh, so, on, again, I think it made an impact in those 10 years, but unfortunately short-lived. And in closing, the last few slides, uh, of course, this is a mile run off of I-80. And um, uh, by 1912, the best timber was already harvested. Uh, the automobile was gaining popularity. The public road system was improving. And uh, so by 1918, Whitmer and Steele moved their logging operations to Cornwall, Virginia. Cornwall, Virginia. Here's what we have today. You walk some of the abandoned roadbeds. Our state flower, the mouth laurel, is taking over. There's some places you could not get through. You have to walk around. It's that thick. But uh, fortunately, I guess, most of the abandoned roadways of the two logging railroads are on the state forest land, uh, Eagle, Bald Eagle State Forest. I-80 construction, it, it did a number on the right of way. It, it broke it up in several pieces. But it's still somewhat intact, but in short pieces. And even though the mountain laurel claims other areas, you got other areas of the roadbed, the main line, uh, you know, like this. The tree can't be up. And that's I-80 in the background. You always can recognize it with the stone boughs. I don't know about you folks, but I can envision uh, a climax engine coming at you, blowing the whistle. I, uh, Many Sundays I would walk these roadbeds and I just envisioned the sounds of the steam roadbeds. And then in closing, this is my son about 15 years ago. <laughs> He's a drag of uh, But I think it's important, it's in closing, important to, to preserve this, the, the message here, to preserve and educate generations to come. We need to keep the, the, the way of transportation, the mode of transportation, and the way of life that existed around these parts, you know, over 100 years ago. With that, I say thank you very much. Well, take some questions if you have any questions. Back in the back. The overturned uh, engine there. Uh, what would be the mechanism to get it back up to 30 ton turnover? Yeah, what little I had to go on through the, the, the books, uh, they, they actually pulled it with another locomotive, they pulled it up, and then tried to set it up with another climax engine.
That's what they used. I don't know how they, all the details, but that's what they used. Yeah. On your trips up through there, did you ever see any rattlesnakes? You know, that's, that's a good question. And no, I spent many Sunday afternoons throughout, you know, from the 1970s to about five years ago. I, I have two bad knees now <laughs> to prove it. But uh, I walked a lot of roadbed, never encountered a rattlesnake or a bear. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I saw on that uh, schedule of stops that it, it listed Zimmerman. Was that for the Zimmerman Road farm, the Canal Sand Road? Uh, Zimmerman's Gap is right before Tea Spring. Yep. Yep. But there are road. Yep. I, I can say it runs. Is that the name of the road? Okay. No, it's called Zimmerman Road. Okay. Road. Yep. Zimmerman owned Sam Road before Judge Johnson. I, I should have said, the, the other seven stops on the time table were called flag stops. So the train did not stop unless you had someone there wanting to ride. You'd have to wait the engineer down. Otherwise, the train kept going. So that was, the other seven stops, like Zimmerman's, were flag stops. Yes? What was the rise in elevation from what you did? Yeah, good question. I don't have a clear answer on that one. The question was, you know, what was the elevation increase from White Gear, uh, which is down by the river, to Sugar Valley or Logan? Don't know that for, I, that's a good question, Dave. But I can tell you the grade, the grade that the train went on, 3.8% grade. That was near mile one, 3.8% grade at the steepest part. If that doesn't answer your elevation. Yes, sir. Who was the young lady in the picture? <laughs> Mrs. Baylor, would you like to answer that? I prefer not to. <laughs> <laughs> it was her mother. It was her mother. Decade. So it would be early 1890s, uh, where, you, where you had a man riding a, a log car to the sawmill from the mountain, all gravity fed. And then horses or mules would pull the car back the, the next day. But again, very dangerous occupation, riding with a handbrake. But that was the decade before the uh, steam locomotives took over. Good question. Another one, yes? Can you help me understand, using today's landmarks, where the sawmill was? Good, good question. Yeah, um, again, it's, it's part of the state forest lands. A little, a little niche of the state forest comes down in there. <clears throat> if you know where the White Gear Reading Station is, just go north on Route 15, probably about a half a mile. There's a, a private road to your left, so you'd have to cross the southbound lane of 15. And you can go back here. It looks like it's private, but it is owned by the state forest. But you can park back here. Well, well, yeah, it's, it's confusing because we all know there's a works of sawmill that stands today that's not not functioning up White Gear Pipe. But the sawmill after the White Gear Lumber Company, my understanding, when they closed in 1922, then they started using private individuals, and there was a works that ran the sawmill. Joe works. Joe, thank you. Word. Thank you. Joe, thank you. Joe, the first day. So Joe works operated the sawmill you see on the picture. It, it, it was downsized gradually. But, uh, so yes, so it's a little confusing. It was two works of sawmill. Yes, sir. Do you have any information about who the photographers were who took a lot of the photographs? Yeah, I wish I did. Almost, I can safe to say 90% of the black and white photographs you saw today came from Mr. Klein. I drove down to Lancaster County where he lived in the 80s, and uh, he was very generous to share those photographs. I was able to get copies of those photographs. So, uh, but as far as, well, the only answer I can have is that he told me knocking on doors, and, and Tom Tabor said the same thing, knocking on doors, one of the first questions, do you have any photographs? Some families uh, would give them 
four or five a day, others had no photographs. He said a good day in collecting photographs was five to seven on a day of interviewing. I saw, yes. Uh, 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 yep, from Northumberland, part of the steel thing. And um, that a fine man. He came to my dad's office and there were a whole mess of pictures there. And they donated to the Pennsylvania uh, Railroad Museum in Strasbourg. And so that someone would down there. Yep. Yep. So you were what relation to uh, Harry? And Harry was my great uncle. He was my great uncle. Thank you very much. I, thank you. Appreciate it. And he shared that the photographs was from Northumberland made it way down to the Railroad Museum in Strasbourg. And I had an opportunity to go through their archives, and they supplied some of the photographs as well. But they were from the client estate, you know, donated by the client estate. But I, I gave, donated some of the books to record to the Pennsylvania Public Museum. Great, thank you. Great museum up, up north. I can't think of the town nearby, but here we go. Okay, it's the Lumber Museum of the state. Yes, sir. Did the uh, Lewisburg uh, Buffalo Valley head west along what today is the rail trail? And if so, did it head, where did it head north up to uh, Spruce yeah. Rocks? Yeah, the rail, rail the trails is uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad, the Lewisburg Tyrone Line, L and T, nickname L and T. So that's where the trail is. But the, uh, the, the narrow gauge of Lewisburg and Buffalo Valley took off, right? Uh, I can tell you if you know where Kelly, uh, no, Kelly Point. Kelly Point. If, if you know where Kelly Point is off of Colonel John Kelly, uh, it, it nipped that area and went towards the Spruce One Water Dam. So it left Lewisburg on a diagonal line northwest. There was a map of that in uh, one of the books. Yep. It all the way from Spruce One Water Dam down. It's almost going to pick it out. I know I used to I have an idea where it is. I think on the East <coughs> Yeah, unlike the White Deer Valley Railroad through the state forest land, that's fairly preserved in size I-80. But for the Lewisburg Buffalo Valley, the first 10 miles of the line was in farmland, and the farmers have now cleared, cleared that out. So hard to trace from Lewisburg to Spruce from Waterdale. I have yet to find the, the main camp, that Culp Station, or Wool here. I, I've been trying to find that camp location somewhere around the water dam, empty-handed. Yes, in the back. The Narrow Gauge Railroad. I don't know if any of you remember Ernest Knoll, Ernie Knoll. He was a master craftsmanship, craftsmanship. But anyway, he told me his life story as a young boy, uh, going on the Narrow Gauge Railroad to Eagles Near to work in the summer because his sister was uh, working up at the Crestmont Hotel, and he went many years. So. I think he said it started in Lewisburg, but where did it connect? They had to go to Williamsport? Hall, Hall Station, up yeah. near the Upper Mall. Okay. Yeah. But you're, there was an air gauge operation then north of there, north <laughs> east, I think. And what was the name of it? Williamsport, North Bridge. Williamsport, North Bridge. Williamsport, Southside, North Bridge. Yes, sir. Ted, back in 1977, Larry Warford was inside the wall. Some of the original tracking rights of the East Fork North Branch. He went up to Pitcher Rocks, he started to there, we've seen the first rattlesnake. That, was it, that. <laughs> <laughs> that would add mine too. I was going to say to Bucky Gilbert's, our son told me that the site was held there by a mate that just loaded with rats. Are you lucky? Yeah, I, I, I really was lucky not to encounter a snake or a bear. I saw a lot of signs of bear, but no, no personal encounters. Yes, sir. They were not the same size. Rails, the question was weight rails. Uh, narrow gauge versus standard, and it's all a manufactured uh, T-rail, of course, but in weight. It's, it's all about weight, and, and you 
you're looking at 20 and 30 pound weight and rail versus yeah. 100, 130 on the standard gauge. So a big difference in weight. But same design, don't know about the manufacturing, but the same design. Yes, sir. So where was T Springs at? Yeah, today T Springs is, is a little bit of a, a parking area by the state forest lands. You, you'll find a brand new outdoor bathroom facility. There's also a picnic table. And there's a few few picnic tables. Is it flat there? Yeah, flat with large white pine. Yeah, so if you go you go up the pipe and you go across the street, and the first thing on the right is in the road, and about a half a mile up, you'll see a picnic it's right between, uh, near the line between Clinton County and the Union County. But you're right. The, the gentleman was right. Yeah. I mean, you could miss it, miss it if you're not knowing what you're looking for. You can drive by, but there is a sign here. <coughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You can't see it on a no. A couple more questions, and we'll wrap it up. What your station still stands, right? I'm sorry. What your station still stands right off Route 15? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Who maintains that? Yep. Good Good question. question. <laughs> <laughs> our, our president is sitting right here. Ron, you, you want to, Ron Johnson, you want to share who owns it? Well, the National Railroad Historical Society of uh, Central Pennsylvania chapter owns it. We maintain it, and we're usually there every Sunday from 1 to 4, so if anybody wants to come up and see the stuff up there, we have. We have a lot of artifacts and everything, but we maintain it. It was bought in 1920, or 1978 or so, and it, Took about 10 years to fix it up to where it is right now. So it looks pretty much like it did back then. Thanks, Ron, for the plug and the advertising. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ron. So any, any other? A couple more and then we'll close up. Yes, Mrs. Bill. Stephen, wood or coal? Uh, coal. You, you would think wood, right? Wood, but no, burn coal. I think it was more efficient. Uh, I'm guessing from the coal fields, Schmoken, you know, we had connections, the Pensy and the Red had connections with Schmoken and the coal fields. So they would supply these narrow gauges with coal. As they brought the you know, coal in, they took the lumber out. One more in the back. Okay. Uh, if you want to go on a wonderful narrow gauge railroad trip from Durango to Silverton, I mean, you won't be sorry. It is wonderful. Thank you. That's on my bucket list. I didn't make it. Oh, and also the Antonito to Chicago. Okay, sir. Antonito to Chicago. It's fantastic. It's part of the same line. Hold on. One more. One more. It's coming down from the other way here. What was the area? They did. That was that Lewisburg Bustle Valley uh, Railroad from Paul Enterprise in Lewisburg. I didn't want to confuse you, Colorado. but they, they, they incorporated a railroad called Sugar Valley Railroad, the Sugar Valley. So it was actually the Sugar Valley Railroad that crossed with the White Deer Valley at that, at that time. But that was strictly on paper. The reason I asked is the road I did on, I did last year, or seen it if you our road is a narrow gauge yeah. right away through. Yeah, well, probably the Sugar Valley, but it was owned, owned by the same way. What was the settlement of 1904 that you talked about? Yeah, I missed that on my notes. Uh, you know what nerves can do. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Thank you, John. The legal settlement in 1904 between the two logging railroads, again, White Deer Valley and the Lewisburg Buffalo Valley, or Sugar Valley was another name for it, uh, where they crossed. The, the settlement was this. And it, both companies accused each other of lumbering on their own land, you know, others, the other's land. So the settlement, the court settlement was quick and done, quick and easy. Survey map, 1904, and once the, in the same year, the courts decide all timberlands north of White Deer Creek becomes White Deer Valley. Every timberland south, all this timberland south of White Deer became, uh, you know, the Lewisburg and Buffalo Valley, including the track, the track and the timber. So White Deer Creek played a very important role in that settlement. 1904, and both parties agreed to it, and they went, you know, went to town on Marx. So they didn't want to waste time, you know, you know dis disputing property rights. Okay, one more thing. If anybody wants to ride a wonderful ride 
of the side of a mountain, Cass City Railroad, Cass, West Virginia, and they have five actors, icebergs, and shades. Yep. And let, let me tell you a little story about the time in 1987. All the people down at the station was carrying blankets and jackets. We thought they were crazy. 3,220 feet up the top of Paul Knob, we were crazy. We were crazy. <laughs> I did experience that. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.